Oops. And of course my window broke so I need to move it back in place. <laughs> but we are we are streaming. Uh, let me just make you as your window as yeah. So that's it. After this very professional introduction, welcome to another Cafe Rollist. Uh, today I have the pleasure of being joined by Zahir Lanier. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, uh, I'm Zahir. I'm the uh, writer and creator for the Home Herder comic, um, which is finishing up its campaign on the Kickstarter tomorrow. So um. I'm pretty excited about that. Amazing. So people should rush there. If you're watching that on YouTube, uh, you should go <laughs> there. Usually we, we discuss more tabletop role-playing games. So today it's for, for comics. Uh, that's that's a nice change. Um, yeah, let's start. Uh, oh. So Yeah, sorry, you were saying? One of our, um, our biggest stretch goal is actually a one-shot one -shot tabletop game for the Bone Herder and the Bone Herder universe. It's like our, like, Type dream, but it's something that like I really hope that we do get. It. <laughs> it's a big, big one. We can still make it. There's 30 hours left, so people are encouraged to to go there. And if people are watching this uh, several days after we record it, or may probably hearing this in the podcast uh, much later, uh, yeah, still go check the the links in the description. Maybe the I assume there will be late pledges and maybe stuff they can do uh, to to support the project uh, after it's over. Awesome. Great. Uh, so this show started as a spin-off because of the lockdown here. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm s almost sporting uh, a mulet now. Uh, it's time for me to go <laughs> to the hairdresser. So we got uh, two questions which are sort of traditional. Uh, is uh, What's your routine like at the moment? Is it uh, any different than it's been uh, a while ago? Yeah, it's... It's like the worst groundhog day ever. Like, all I, I like wake up and then I like lie in bed. I go and get some coffee and then I watch like way too much Netflix <laughs> and then like maybe do some work on the computer and then watch more Netflix. There's and maybe play some video games. Just uh, maybe go for like a walk outside or something every once in a while. But I've been in quarantine since. February, so it's, it's getting to me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I was tweeting recently and I, I had all the dates wrong. I said I had been in quarantine for eight months, which was not the case, but it it feels like that. At this point, I don't know anymore when, when the quarantine started. I just know I'm unemployed yeah. since late January and my wife's been working from home quite early. I don't know. I'm I'm lost and confused with things. Do you have any good video games or Netflix show to recommend? Um, I just watched The Haunting of Hill House with my girlfriend. I rewatched it. Um, it's really good. I like the horror aspect is like part of it, but at its heart, it's like kind of a family drama and about like perceived mental illnesses and stuff. But that was pretty good. And we watched The Old Guard last night, which was like a really solid solid movie like really good action scenes and Charlie's there and just whips ass so that was pretty awesome yeah I heard a lot of good things uh, about that uh, about the old guard are you taking notes for a potential adaptation to Netflix of the Nerf Herder or worst case scenario to I mean, Amazon Try? I, I would love for that to happen like a couple people like I could see it being like The Witcher and like that does sound super appealing, but I'm not like holding my breath for Netflix to reach out anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> like, you know, my Kickstarter versus like a multi billion dollar franchise, like, <laughs> probably not the same thing. <laughs> yeah, the, the Witcher would be quite cool. It would be cool even to have a, a video game, the, the Bone Herder. And then, and then you get uh, the the Netflix show. You know, step by step. You know, baby steps uh, towards <laughs> this sort of yeah. things. Any uh, <laughs> any dream casting uh, for the main part? Uh? Um, I would love to do like Jon Snow. Like that would be really cool. Like I would love to do that. Just because I feel like it, 
I don't know, I, they always like ask people that you know very well in those type of roles, I feel like, and I want to see someone like brand new in the industry, like just really take the role and make it their own, like be the new face of something. I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah, take someone from uh, from the world of theater, for instance, their f debut on screen, so they're fresh in your mind and they, they can really inhabit that, that role. And uh, and usually they pay, they take someone from Great Britain for some reason. I mean, I, I don't have a horse in that <laughs> fight because uh, I'm an immigrant here, but I, I cannot help to notice like, oh, it's Britain again. So it's so weird that... that American actors must be so frustrated <laughs> with the export of uh, <laughs> British actors. I have noticed that. Or like you don't, you watch him in a show for like four years and then you finally watch an interview and you're like, wait, that guy's like Australian or something. <laughs> Completely different than what you thought. So the boner, the, tell us what is it, uh, it is about. So that's, that's your sales pitch now. You need to, you got 30 hours <laughs> to convince people to, to break the bank so we reach uh, 120,000 yeah. dollars so we got our one shot <laughs> tabletop role playing bit. Um, so it's, it's an Afropunk fantasy horror comic, and the premise, I came up with it during uh, Gail Simone, she's a pretty well-known comics writer, did a comic school when quarantine first was starting, just to give people, like, something to do during quarantine, so over the course of, I think it was four or five days, she taught us how to, like, write a basic comic, just because... Like screenwriting has like a standard like layout, um, you know, just like writing a prose is like pretty, not simple, but like you can just do it. But comics, I feel like, at least for me, it was intimidating because I had no idea like how to lay it out, how to do it. And she like gave us those basic steps and then she really liked the premise and, uh, and she liked my final product. So I was like, oh, I can do a Kickstarter. And it's, uh, so every generation there's a child born and they go from village to village and they find people who've done crimes and they punish them by flaying their bones and burying them. And then Cass is our, like one of our main characters and she's the one chosen, but she doesn't want to do it. And when she does that, she breaks a path with the flesh wound, which will have ramifications down the road. Cool. So it's pretty dark, actually. <laughs> Perfect for Netflix. So, <laughs> so wh where does the premise come from? Is it uh, your own creation, or is there traditional stories which inspired you somehow? Uh, it's 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 um, the first time I heard of someone picking away the bones of their victims. It just it, honestly, it just kind of popped in my head. Um, I know there, like historically, there have been like sin eaters I guess do they like absolve the sins of other people and take the blame for themselves and I kind of thought of like the reverse of that someone who like comes and completely punishes you for whatever you've done and they're doing it in the service of some type of vague unknown entity I guess <laughs> like I, I didn't have like a I get like I literally just was like oh that would be weird <laughs> and I just started writing it so the the world is described as Afropunk fantasy. Did did your setting come first? Did did the character come first, or the the premise itself, or what um, was the the journey of uh, the creation, sort of? Well, the the genre came first. She Gail told us to get two dice and just roll them, and then like one was like romance, two was comedy, three was, you know, whatever, like three different genres. And I just happened to get fantasy horror. And then I I always want more people that look like me in, in media. And so that's how I kind of ended up going with like an Afro punk um, theme. So it's like pre-colonial Africa. And I wanted it to be a not completely Western fantasy story. Um, I feel like that's something we see a lot like medieval Europe or you know, Vikings, like that type of thing, but we don't really see anything set on like the African continent and like those ancient civilizations. Um, and I feel like that goes against the norm, which is kind of what Afropunk is, kind of like reclaiming your identity against what's kind of status quo. And we could definitely agree that like 
the Western viewpoint of fantasy is pretty much, you know, mostly white or, you know, has some, if it visits other areas, it tends to be a little bit stereotypical sometimes. Um, and so I wanted to make something that was just like for me and for people who look like me, I guess. Well, it's, I mean, even if it's not people who look like me, I would say I, I find, you know, seeing again and again the same thing, the same type of individuals on screen and in stories, yeah. it's just boring. It's it's boring <laughs> as hell. Uh, it's, I mean, yeah, and recently I, I started paying a bit more attention to that and, and suddenly you, it, it becomes very obvious when, when I travel back well, not back because, uh, uh, but uh, when I visit family uh, in Belgium or in France, where standards are even lower in that field, uh, okay. it's it's just jarring and uh, yeah, very annoying. But uh, when you when you say Afropunk, um, is it is it mainly about that about representation? You you I mean the expression in Bone Herder itself. Uh, is it about the ethnicity of the, the main character, which qualifies them as Afropunk in your sight, or uh, are there cultural um, elements, elements or visual elements? What what builds up that that identity in your view? Um, Afropunk is kind of hard to define. Like, there's no agreed upon definition. I like guess. like all punks, <laughs> it's an any right. punk thing is a nightmare to define. And so. Afropunk started as like a music genre. It was a, a punk, um, but it was specifically towards like the, the, the black experience in like America or in that diaspora. Um, and now it's kind of like fleshed out to, it's like a wider aesthetic, but like I, I said, I, I think it's just it gives the status quo. Um, I'm not like from, like I'm, my ancestors are from Africa but I don't, because of slavery and, and, you know, the U.S., I don't know, like, where from, so I don't really have a, a history. So for me, Afropunk is kind of a way to, at least through this comic, as a way to kind of pay homage to where I'm from without, but also it's a little sad because I don't, I can't be very specific with it. You know what I mean? Like, I can put out that, this idea but I can't say oh this is inspired by you know my people's you know we came from this country and we have these traditions kind of like a for me it's, it's like a hopefulness of like this is what I imagine it could have been like in my own like little fantasy world it's, and, I, and I like it because it gives me the opportunity to like research different cultures and, and you know try to put elements of things into it and try to do it in a respectful manner um, instead of just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall or a bunch of stereotypes, it's it's been interesting to like actually do research on like actual civilizations and um, oh, trying to like find proper kente cloth patterns for our characters. And one of my favorite things is that the characters they have like like black hair. You know, it's not like sometimes you see like a fantasy elf or something and they're black, but their hair is like straight and European. I'm like, but that's not really like a black elf that's like a white elf with a tan <laughs> in my opinion like that's what it feels like and this is like oh they have like locks or they have braids or they have like hairs in a puff and you know the little girl has a puff too and it's it's like really exciting that way there's so many truly fascinating i was about to say bits but there are way more than bits there are uh, spans of history uh, in Africa. I saw in uh, your description you mentioned Kush and Carthage. Uh, there's so many kings and stories and uh, kingdoms and empires which existed and uh, are not covered in the, the curriculum. Uh, well, I'm not aware of the one in the US, uh, but uh, certainly not in Britain and not where I grew up, which was Belgium, which uh, by the way, uh, before I watch your video, I was wondering about how to appropriately pronounce your name because uh, <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a former uh, it's a um, it's one of the names which were the names of the the Republic of, of Congo. So so actually, you got this name, but you you have no no mean uh, of knowing whether or not you would 
be your family would be from this area rather than, yeah. than another you, those ties were, were cut uh, in history mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's Zaire and then my last name I guess is technically French so it would be pronounced Lamier but uh it's pronounced Lamier over here so <laughs> oh sorry for pronouncing it uh, the French way oh no it's no it's fine I don't I don't mind <laughs> So, uh, have you seen other uh, works which you thought were, were interesting uh, in that realm of Afropunk? Because you're mentioning music, and uh, I did listen a, a bit of uh, to a bit of African music. Although, what does that mean? Because it's a, it's a whole continent, so there's a lot of different types of music. But are there works you would recommend people? Uh, you'd like people to check out? Uh, it can be comics or novels um. or music. I mean, there, there's a lot of, music-wise, I'm not great with music. My car doesn't have a radio, so I haven't been up to date, because I would normally listen to it on like, the way to work or something. But um, book-wise, um, I would start with Octavia Butler. I feel like she's, like, hands down in terms of Black sci-fi writers, one of the, like, like, just like the foundation for, I honestly think a lot of black sci-fi and beyond black sci-fi. Sorry, what did you today. say? I couldn't hear you. Octavia Butler. Okay, cool. Um, and then N.K. Jemison, she wrote the, um, the, uh, I'm having a, I think the Broken Earth series. I'm having a brain fart. I don't like it. At all. Um, <laughs> but those are the two that, or the, yeah, the two that I would start with. Um, I think they're both pretty accessible and they're honestly just really, really good, good reads. I'm looking up in my uh, hard drive right now because there, there was a, a compilation of music I I really liked and I, I cannot find the name of the artist. Uh, it's a electronic artist from maybe the 70s and uh, he sort of disappeared after do publishing uh, quite a lot of of his work. <sighs> What's his name? Just cannot find it. Any <laughs> anyway. Um, so your background is uh, uh, as a writer then, uh, and so and doing comics was something you'd never considered before uh, before the, this ah, this workshop. Really? Um. Like, I, well, actually, I think the first thing I remember writing as a kid was a comic. It was like a, like one of those four strip panels you see in like the Sunday paper. And it was called Captain McMeow Meow, and it was about a, like a detective cat or something like that. But I, you know, when you're little, you're not like, you don't judge yourself as harshly, I guess. So I used to draw my own like panels and they weren't very good, but I like didn't care because they were like my art panels. Then at some point, I, I think I got away from that. Like, I got away from like drawing and stuff, and I mostly focused on writing. And I just, I think I just was intimidated by the overall process because I felt like I needed to be able to draw my comic as well as write it. And I think doing Gail's Comic School kind of just got me to just like do it and see that I enjoyed it. And then I found a concept artist and an artist um, to to draw it at some point. I was like, this is actually pretty good, and I might want to expand this and uh, what did you think of the the reaction of people the the feedback uh, on, on your kickstarter but i find it very impressive you seem to have done that very within a very small time frame yeah it was it was kind of weird because like i had an artist and then they had to drop out because of family obligations and then it took me like and it took me a long time to find the first one so i was like really stressed out and i was like ah like whatever i don't i don't even want to do this anymore it's stupid and then <laughs> the artist i asked first and he at first wasn't going to do it because i didn't have like i couldn't pay a full amount up front which is understandable you know everyone wants to be paid for their labor um but i emailed him at like two in the morning you know i have been drinking a little bit and i was like please <laughs> I really love your art style and then he was like actually I've been thinking about your script for like or about your script for about a month and he said I really liked it and so I'll I'll come on board for the project which was like really exciting because he 
like initially turned me down and, and you know, I was like kind of desperate to find someone. But then once he drew that first, like the first page and then he had, I had a concept artist, um, her name's Morgan. Um, and seeing everyone's like reaction was really exciting because I didn't think it, like, I didn't think I was going to get the full 5,000. I thought it was going to be like, you know, all the way through the end and then we got funded in 34 minutes and I think people are just really excited for something different um just not the usual like settings and the usual faces and, the, and it I don't know it, it, it means a lot I guess like like everyone's been really supportive and the people who haven't been it's like there are so many who are that I just don't care <laughs> you know um it's it's been it's been really really awesome so well, yeah, we we you're almost done with that campaign. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the the things which are already financed, uh, whether they were planned yeah. from the start and um, the stuff which are unlocked? Yeah. So our first our first goal with the five thousand was literally it was only going to be eight pages. Um, it was going to be like a really small, just eight page comic. Um, just because I wanted to see it brought to life, and then. We hit the next stretch goal, which was like 7,500 or something. And I can pay the artist more because I really believe in paying everyone what they're worth. So I've, I've been trying to like build into each stretch goal, um, like a little bit of a cushion to pay the artists, like either a bonus or whatever. And now that we've, you know, got like $70,000 at this point, I can like really, I'm really excited to be able to like pay people to do what they love and what they're good at. But then uh, our next stretch goal, I can do a full first comic. So it'll be between, I haven't quite finished the script yet. It'll be between like 22 and then maybe like 36 pages, somewhere between that. I can do a full first issue. And then we have two stretch goals that we hit. One is the Bone Herders Tool Guide. And it's kind of just like a, it's gonna be an illustrated like what all their knives do, like what they carry day to day. It's I, I'm really excited for it. I think it's gonna be kind of cool, like just their toolbox. And I've been like, what kind of knives do butchers use? You know, it's like my <laughs> internet history looks really sketchy right now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> like, like no officer, I promise. <laughs> like it's for my comic strip. Um, but it's gonna be that. And then the next one is. Uh, a conservationist account of Coatrome's animals. And Coatrome is like the mythical country that I've created. Um, and it's going to be like what the wildlife looks there. And some of it's going to be like super familiar and some of it's going to be obviously more like fantasy oriented. And, uh, and then our last two is a shadow tracker's guide to rare and unseen animals. And that one's kind of like a bestiary. So it's going to be like all the creepy animals or like the like magical animals that exist in Coltrum. And then the last one's kind of like an atlas of the people and like the landscapes, like these mountain ranges or like this people's culture. And, and, and then the final one that we haven't hit yet is obviously that tabletop RPG. Um, but all the, the, the four information books, I guess, are going to be like digital because those are kind of plan at the last minute because we wanted to do more but not have to worry about printing and shipping costs so so yeah the, you because the re, one of the reason I heard of your project was uh, because you are uh, quite visible in the tabletop RPG community what's your journey with that you are you an ardent tabletop pro player yourself um, or that kind of surprises me because I I only started getting into tabletop games maybe like a year ago. I did, um, I got hired to write, um, someone was doing like a, like a, a Dungeons and Dragons like supplementary book and they hired me to write some like character profiles for them. And then I, and then I played a few D and D campaigns, but I'm, I would like to do more with it, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised that like, it's that I'm visible in there. Cause I think I do more of like, video game writing or trying to at least um but i realized i wanted to write for a living and so i just hopped on twitter <laughs> and i found like 
someone kind of famous and I was just like I followed as many people that they followed so I could like get into the community because I didn't know what to do otherwise um and then I just started having conversations and then at some point instead of trying to like talk to like the, the big big people you try to find people who are like at your level because those people are your peers instead of like trying to like suck up to or or it's better I found it better to like stay on your on your level I guess in, in some ways because those are the people who like advance with you and are growing with you at the same rate you are and they like still know like what you're going through and, and it and it and I, I don't know I just slowly started getting a following especially after the bone herder took off like I went from like 800 followers to like 3,000 in like two weeks so it's kind of weird but um I don't know that was I don't know that's what I did <laughs> <laughs> so so have you played or you just wrote for it so far yeah I, I I've played I think three or four since I started last year like I wrote for it and I've like played some and, and I've done like some of the smaller RPGs like on the um, itch.io like those are like the ones you can just print out at home like some of the smaller ones I've dabbled in those but I haven't done as much uh, like other than the bone herder that's all oh, the bone herder one I wanted to hire people who like have a lot more experience than me because like I know my wheelhouse and I know if I tried to write write it by myself it wouldn't be the best product that it could be um but it's something I, I do want to get more into because I've really, really, really enjoyed the games that I've played and people are just so creative with like even the, the stuff they the, the smaller stuff is just like fascinating me. It's so cool. Amazing. Uh so what are the next steps for, for the Boone Herder now? Uh a lot of writing and then then art. Yeah. <laughs> uh and, and well, then what? I have a series to show it to uh, established publisher or self-publishing? Uh, what do you have in mind? Yeah. Well, we're, we are going to try to get all this stuff out um, before the end of the year, hopefully. And then, yeah, I, I've been thinking about submitting to a publisher. Um, Self-publishing has been fun for the first issue, but I can't imagine having to, like, raise more funds or, like, ship all the boxes myself and... You know, like it's, it, 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 I feel like it would definitely be more convenient for me to have a publisher help me out, um, you know, take their cut or whatever, but definitely like let the professional professionals handle it. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't mind if it, if it went further. Like I, I, I have been like kind of mapping out like a series and kind of more lore and stuff. But I just we're just so far removed from my eight page comic that like I'm still processing like oh this might be something that people want to see more of and like that I want to see more of because I just didn't think that was possible at first but just the overwhelming response definitely makes me feel like I could do more with it and it would be relatively successful like I don't think I'll be getting a bunch of movie deals anytime soon but you know, that's not what I'm trying to measure it by. I think it would just be cool, you know? But you don't have large arcs in mind already, like uh, allegedly George Lucas already had the prequels in mind, the three movies, the prequels, <laughs> and the sequels. You don't know what the journey of your character is going to be like. You, you, you don't have, I have pictures. I have like a general <laughs> like idea, but no, I, I haven't like for sure got an issue one, this is going to happen, and issue two, this is going to happen. It's like, this cloud of ideas that I have to like, you know, pick out and, and outline and see what works best, you know? Well, who knows, maybe in a few years you, you'll you be uh, carried away by the, the success of the Bone Herd and you you will be like uh, those authors who publish things under a fake name because they're like, I'm so tired to hear about the Bone Herder. I'm not, I'm not a one-trick pony. I can write, I can write romance as well, and uh, and a horror <laughs> and things for children. Why, why is everybody right. asking me about that? <laughs> well, let's only wish. <laughs> Sounds like a good problem to have. <laughs> 
So you don't have any other projects already in mind? Things you're you you're working on, um, or you were working on before the, all of this happened? I mean, I do game writing, um, so I have like my own little personal like interactive fiction projects that I've been working on. Um, nothing like ready to show the public yet or anything, but right now I'm just like kind of focusing on this just because it's very, very much in like the public eye, I guess. And so I, that's kind of like what I've shifted my focus to just so that I can be the best that it can be. You know, I don't want to put together something that's not very great. <laughs> and then people will be, and that's like, when it blew up that like I got nervous too because it was like oh man like seventy thousand dollars is like put you way more out there than just you know like five thousand so now I'm like oh it has to be like perfect <laughs> you know I get not that it wasn't going to be before but like like I feel way more pressured I guess it needs to be seventy thousand perfect now before it, <laughs> yeah. it just needed to be five thousand dollars perfect right <laughs> it's... like that's more money than I've made probably in the last like shoot like six years you know like yeah it take, would take me a couple of years when i'm employed <laughs> which is not the case uh, all the time uh yeah. what was i always oh, running out of questions lately uh <laughs> it's okay <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, you've been going for a minute. I, actually, I'm co I'm considering doing a Kickstarter uh, myself uh, in a year and a half, and uh, in the the uh, table t gaming uh, realm. But I was wondering, as you are towards the end of your campaign, uh, are there things you wished you had been around to tell yourself? You know, oh Zaire. You need to think about that when you engage in this path of Kickstarter campaign. Uh, things you didn't think of, you advice you would wish you you would provide yourself. Probably, I didn't think to pay myself at first. Like, you know, I, I was like, pay the artists. Um, you know, I'm gonna have to pay like shipping, but like two or three people, like, well, you need to to pay yourself like you're doing work too you're you're marketing you're promoting you're being basically like a team leader so I, I think probably not undervaluing yourself like you you got like at first I think I was only gonna do I think it was like fifteen hundred dollars it wasn't very much at all um that was enough to pay the artist and enough to pay uh just like ship it out and stuff and then someone else was like well you should cushion yourself a little bit and then pay yourself. So I think just valuing your skills. Um, yeah, valuing your skills and, and recognizing like, oh, I deserve to get paid too. Like I have to work on this and I have to do good too. And also like definitely work out a budget beforehand. Don't be like, <laughs> The day before it launches, you're like <laughs> on your computer, desperately like, oh wait, I forgot about this, this, and this. You know, like really plan for it. Like I didn't quite fly by the seat of my pants, but it definitely wasn't in the front end as organized as it could have been. Um, but yeah, I think, and I think just relax. Like once it launches, um, you know do whatever you do on social media like I promote mostly on Twitter a little bit on Facebook but not really um but don't like grind yourself into the dirt like trying to constantly be like on like at some point you just kind of like put it out into the world and this is what happens um especially because I got funded in like like I said 34 minutes so I didn't have a reason to like be breaking my back <laughs> trying to like constantly market it like i'm already funded just let whatever happens happens it's uh well i, I guess meaning that you your advice would be to to remunerate yourself better that means you you've grown more confident uh with your skills and value and projects so i, think I guess so. that's a nice growth to have uh, across the course of your your campaign yeah i think it's i think it's pretty validating because like you'll always have like the people in your life that like know you and love you and they'll say like oh you're doing a really good job and that stuff is like soup and it's really meaningful but it's different when like complete strangers from all over the world are like 
oh, this is good, you know, like, it's, 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 it doesn't make those, like, compliments and, like, encouragement from the people you know, like, any less, but it, it's just a little different, I guess. Um, it was really validating. Oh, and my other piece of advice would be, like, if your Kickstarter's in, like, mine started in June, and I started advertising for it in, like, May or April, like, get yourself into the community first, and, like, support other people in, like, a genuine way, not in a, like, obviously, like, oh, I'm only talking to you because I want you to help me in the future, or because I, like, want to be close to people who have a lot of talent, like, actually be, like, a like a well-meaning person and like get that get a reputation I guess for being like a nice helpful person and I think that's I, I hope that's in part why it took off because like on Twitter I try to be like encouraging or funny or you know we all send each other like job listings because we're all you know we're all vying for the same few spots in the industry but like that doesn't mean that they're your competition. They're like, you kind of build each other up, you know? Mm -hmm. Have you seen any, uh, I mean, are you applying for things on the side? Have you seen anything which caught your eye and uh, was maybe yeah, a hope? I, I applied for a few um, gaming jobs. Um, I actually heard back from one, but don't know if I'm allowed to announce it no, yet. Of course, no. <laughs> I haven't signed the contract. Let, let's not jinx but, anything um... here. <laughs> let's just cross, <laughs> cross fingers and everything goes well. Um, but, and I applied, I was thinking of applying to a Wizards of the Coast, um, position for a narrative designer, but I don't, I haven't, like, actually done it, but, you know, I, we're always on the job hunt, you know, especially as a, as a freelancer. Yeah. Uh, we've got someone uh, I threw in the, the chat in, uh, in Twitch ask if people had questions. I think uh, a, a bit of clarifications are needed here. We've got, uh, I believe, Richard from the D20 Future Show who asking us to tell us about the Bone Herder RPG. What do the characters do and what is the system like? Uh, th there's no Bone Herder RPG, is there? Or Not is yet. Not yet. Um, I, I do know if we get to that, I know who's going to be helping write it. And they've sent me a few systems that I have, haven't quite had the chance to look over. Um, but I I have been like on my own writing like different classes of bone herder, or, like healers, like the typical kind of RPG stuff. But I haven't figured out what the overall like, I don't know the right word, scope of the game will be yet. I mean, it's a um, big endeavor. It's like... If... Yeah. I mean, it might it might look like from the outside like uh, oh, it's just more writing, but it's actually more akin to 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 coding a video game. So it's, there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for for the people who are gonna help. Um, it's just it's just not it's not something I'm gonna think about too much until it actually happens, just because that opens up like. A whole new world of work <laughs> that has to be done so that one's more like if it happens like we're going to go gung-ho into it and if it doesn't you know we can definitely revisit it in the future because there people have said they were like excited about the idea um but for now it's not anything that like i'm too I'm I'm not putting too much thought. I mean, the the pledge, uh, which is not reached at this point, hopefully it will be, uh, was only for a, a one shot. So someone running a game system within that that universe is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really nice. I mean, yeah, re launching a role playing game unless you've got a big nice deal like something like again The Witcher. Uh, which has its own tabletop role playing game, so you might have a look at that. Okay. Uh, it's a bit crunchy, uh, but uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of rules. It's not the the lightest with rules. Uh, it's it's all usually it's all Kickstarter campaign on its own to launch a role playing yeah. game. So uh, that's that's yeah, a, that's a definitely why big endeavor. I put a big gap. <laughs> yeah. But then you you would have the. Obviously, the the audience of the comics and from your third Kickstarter 
to build upon. So you would have a very strong foundations to to start with, and yeah. all those weird the... tabletop RPG fans which you who got on board <laughs> already. Great. Yeah, for sure. And then we have the the four like PDFs, which are basically like they're they're basically lore books and and bestiaries. So like those would lay the groundwork. Like we'd already have some of that info for whenever we like by a year from now decide I want to run one specifically for you know the game itself. And that would then those are already like they're pick and choose from and, and help develop. Well, there, there, there are other precedents, like uh, there, there's a very popular, uh, there's probably plenty others, there's a very popular uh, comics in France called Lenfirst of Troy, which I always lament there's no English version of it because I think it would be, could be very popular. Uh, uh, it's very seeped with role-playing game uh, mood into it. And, and there, there was not really a role-playing game, but they did release a lot of uh, source books and books about the settings okay. and art books and so on, and then role players seize those this content uh, and they go run their adventures with Me with too. whatever homebrew system uh, they they wish to use. So so once it's out cool. there and you got fans, uh, you have people having adventures in those worlds or fan fiction. That's true. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> Some yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's like the ultimate compliment. Like, I liked your world so much, or maybe you didn't like it so much that you're like, I'm gonna write my own adventures in it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess it's a double-edged sword having fan fiction about something you you created. I assume uh, you you <laughs> wonder <bet>. what it <laughs> turns into. <laughs> oh, I think I lost hearing you. Oh, I got can you. you. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, I was yeah. just saying, R Richard, it was not a, a criticism of your question. I just thought it was, uh, because Richard is commenting in the, the Twitch. Uh, I just wanted to, to have that clarified. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I mean, is there anything else you, you wish to discuss? We got, we got a bit of time. Um, well, I mean, that's... That's pretty much it? Um, pretty much it. I guess if I wanted to end on something, I would say... A large part of this, I think, I, you know, I, I, Black Lives Matter, and I think because of that, Black art matters. Um, you know, I don't think I would have even written a comic book if I hadn't seen, like, Storm, um, The Green Lantern, Black Panther. Like, those are people that, for me, that, like, I grew up and I thought it was so cool that, like, Storm was someone that, like, had the same skin tone as like my mom you know what i mean and seeing someone who you know had hair like me and i think the more we support like black art the more creativity and diversity we see like across all genres um you know i want to see her comics with diverse diversity in it in general you know every hero doesn't have to be like a white buff guy you know, I want to see just more diversity in general. And I think that's a part of why I made this comic was I wanted to just like, I really just want to see people in comics and media that look like me. And I want to see more people like give themselves permission to do that, even if they feel like other people won't like it. Um, it doesn't like matter. Just do it kind of for yourself. Um, but yeah, that's probably all that I have to say other than yeah. yeah, and I mean it's, you know, uh, I grew up. I'm a I'm a white person, uh, but yeah, I had the same characters and some other characters when I grew up. And uh, having characters of color, it's probably one of the the best tools to for inclusiveness because those those character, if you're not surrounded as much, uh, being in a small European nation uh, by people of color or because people don't engage enough with tr true different co communities it's ways for uh, as a child uh, yeah engage that there are people with, who come from different backgrounds who have different appearances different interests and uh, it definitely shape, I think it shapes society to have those heroes which you can share and it's not uh, I mean there's been debates about that like 
people saying, oh, Doctor Who is a woman now. Uh, it's a pity because Doctor Who used to be a hero for the little boy. I'm like, I can't I can have a lady as my hero. Uh, when I was a kid, right. uh, I, I, lo I, I looked up to, I mean, it's, it's a bit silly, but to, to Mr. T because I watched the A-Team in the 80s and uh, and yeah, we were, we. it was an amazing character. I mean, it was 80s level of writing and so on, but uh, that was a character as a <laughs> as a child I was very attached to, and Storm was the same, Bishop, uh, and so on. So yeah. I don't think I don't think Black Panther is a hero which appeals only to to black kids. It appeals to everyone, and I think we all for the better for it. Uh, it's certainly better than having. Everybody with a beard, white, uh, like uh, Doctor Strange and, uh, and Tony Stark, which uh, I don't have an issue with, but uh, uh, it's just nice. It's just nice to have a, a big variety of people, of genders, and uh, etc. Uh, in things. So yeah, okay. so I, I look forward for uh, Bonner to be purchased by Warner and integrated to the DC universe uh, alongside. Uh, <laughs> Gen 13, no, maybe not. Maybe it's better <laughs> to remain independent. <laughs> maybe in the next yeah. Watchmen. But uh, yeah, well, thank you so much, Zaire, uh, for joining for me. Having... Well, it's it's my it's my pleasure, absolutely, uh, totally. And uh, yeah, please uh, please do come back if you have more projects or give us an update uh, on Bone Herder <laughs> if you have a, a new campaign. Uh, for a tabletop roping game or, or something else, uh, that would be uh, amazing. Uh, where can Thank people? You. What, what's your final pitch? Goodbye, and where can people find you if you wish to be found? Um, I guess my final pitch is just if the idea of like an Afro punk horror comic interests you with like creepy, fleshy monsters and you know cool storylines, you should definitely check out the Kickstarter. Um, you can probably find me best on Twitter. It's uh, at Z L A N I E R 21. And my website, if you want to hire me or look at my portfolio, is uh, ZaireLanier.com. So nothing, nothing too fancy. I will put everything in the description of the episode so people can go head there and, and ju just click on, on the link. Thanks, everyone. Uh, goodbye. See you. Goodbye. See you soon. And uh, good luck for with your final 30 hours. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Au revoir.